everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. In this video, I'm looking at an email from Rhonda Hare. She sent me an email about Elder Bednar and how with this last talk in General Conference, it seems that he's been kind of like building up to this talk. And so well, let me just read you what she said. And we're going to go through um, a few things. Okay, so she says, Hi, sometimes I watch your videos and appreciate the effort you put into using only verified sources for quotes in sharing the links to them. Uh, I recently looked at the link in the Young Women's Journal where Wilford Woodruff refers to the, re the release of the Four Angels and found some extra treasures in the Temple Workers' Excursion. Uh, if you don't know what she's talking about, uh, it, was, it was brought up to me the fact that Wilford Woodruff had said that the Angels of Revelation, the Four Angels that were, uh, were being held... Um, they had to wait for the 144,000 to be sealed first, and then after that they would be released to bring judgments upon the earth and do the, the reaping. Well, I guess there's an actual date as to when that happened, and it happened uh, when the Salt Lake Temple was dedicated. And he said it there, and then he said it again, and it's recorded in what was then the Young Women's Journal uh, in an article called The Temple Workers' Excursion. So just do a search on my channel for Wilford Woodruff, and it should bring up bring up that video if you want all the details to that. Uh, and I guess I'll have to go back and see what some of these other extra treasures are. Okay, and then she continues, You've referred a few times to President Nelson saying we're in the bottom of the ninth inning. I haven't found that quote, nor has it been in the couple of videos I've watched of yours where it's quoted. Apparently it's not from conference, because it doesn't show up in either... Uh, gospel library or scripture citation index. Can you point me in the right direction? Yes, uh, Rhonda, I'll have to email it to you because it's a sound clip that someone shared with me from FSY this year. So this wouldn't be in any of the publications. It was just a recording for the youth for FSY. And then uh, I received a story from someone else who said that a 70 had had dinner with Elder Bednar, and he said the same thing. And I, I've done a video on that too. But anyway, I can I'll send you the the audio clip because I still have it saved, and I can send send it to anybody that wants to hear it. But I also include it in the video where I first talk about it. I actually play the clip. So um, anyway, continuing. Also, while I enjoy your videos, I'm a very busy mom of eight who also homeschools. I'm lucky to get one twenty odd minute video in per week, uh, maybe twice a week. Uh, the videos that exceed 30 or 40 minutes aren't even an option, so it's disappointing when the longer ones pop up. And I, I, I totally hear you, but I I can't do anything about that because a lot of the times the topics that I cover, they're just there's too much that I want to share. And sorry, I probably won't be able to adjust that. Um, occasionally, there are some videos that come up where I can just knock it out. But uh, what I would recommend, just watch my videos all in a row and just kind of come back and uh, resume where you left off and then just keep going because it, I, you know, I don't have to cut it up into these uh, smaller chunks. You can just resume and then continue, resume, resume. So that, that's, that's my only suggestion. I, I'm really sorry about that, but I, I understand. Um, also, I don't read through comments for, for time reasons. So I don't know if anyone already pointed this out. Uh, remember a few years ago when Elder Bednar gave three conferences in a row that built on each other, October 2017, April 2018, October 18. And I know what you're talking about. I can't remember exactly what he was building up to. Maybe someone else can put in the comments if you know what she's talking about. But that this does sound familiar. It rings a bell for me. And then she says, he seems to be doing it again with a twist. Look at his April 2022 talk in conjunction with the article he wrote for the July Liahona and last conferences uh, or the last week's conference. Uh, that July article adds details and dimensions to the parable of the wedding feast. Um and then I think there's just a little bit more. Also look at President Nelson's October conference talks in connection with an article that is in the October 2022 Liahona. It's not uh, it's not in print yet, but it can be found online and in the Gospel Library. Thanks. Thank you, Rhonda, for your email. Um, and I was, you know, wanting to look at this because I've, I've felt that Elder Bednar's talk was one of the more 
explicit things that have been said about the second coming in terms of warning us and giving like giving us the answers to the quiz to the test right you, you know what like in in school when you've had like a teacher that they kind of like ahead of time they like give you the answers like they're doing the lesson they write it up on the board they're writing whatever and they're like you might want to write this down this is an answer to uh one of the questions on the test it feels like there's a bit there's been a lot of that going on right in that it's been pretty obvious and so elder bednar um i've already done a video about his talk so that's why this really interests me and i thought it, it would be worth it to go ahead and uh, read some of this. I, I haven't read through this yet, so this is going to be raw. With this one, I may skip down. This this is the one that he gave called... Uh, so th this is in chronological order. So first came his general conference talk, and then July was his article, and then we had this last conference. Okay, So this is the first one in line. And I'm sure everybody rem remembers this one. It was a really, really good talk called But We, Heed we Heeded Them Not. Uh, of course, referring to the world, the uh, those who point and scorn and um, shame people of faith and, and specifically our church, <clears throat> right? So I'm going to skip down, <clears throat> okay, because we don't need to, for the purpose of this video, we don't need to really review that again, but this would be a great talk to go back and read just in your personal story, your, your personal study. I'm going to skip down to here, a personal connection through covenants. I will say, I feel like he's been really hitting on this topic about covenants and how covenants bind us to Christ. They yoke us with Christ. Those are some of the key uh, words and phrases that he's been using. Um, uh, receiving power in covenants, right? The, the power of God through covenants. So, uh, I feel like these are answers. I mean, they're always the answer, but specifically as we approach the second coming, I feel like that's another big reason why he's bringing this up. And I did, I did kind of skim through this and then this article, and there are some second coming specific things that are said, and there may be more as we read this. Okay, entering into sacred covenants and worthily receiving priesthood ordinances. Oh, right off the bat, uh, yoke us with and bind us to the Lord Jesus Christ and Heavenly Father. That's a position that you want to be during the final judgment, and it is also a position that you want to be in at the second coming as the earth is being cleansed. You want to be yoked and binded to Christ and Heavenly Father. He says, this simply means that we trust in the Savior as our advocate and mediator and rely on his merits, mercy, and grace during the journey of life. As we are steadfast in coming unto Christ and are yoked with him, we receive the cleansing, healing, and strengthening blessings of his infinite and eternal atonement. Living in loving covenant commitments creates a connection with the Lord that is deeply personal and spiritually powerful. As we honor the conditions of sacred covenants and ordinances, we gradually and incrementally are drawn closer to him and experience the impact of his divinity and living reality in our lives. Jesus then becomes much more than the central character in scripture stories. His example and teachings influence our very desire, thought, and action. Yeah, and, and that's really, if that's not what we're doing, then we're doing it wrong. We, we should be wanting to change ourselves from the inside out. Sometimes you have to kind of do it from the outside in as you, maybe you don't quite understand what the inside needs to look, look like. But as you um, keep the commandments, you start to like understand as you go through those actions, you're like, ah, oh, okay, this is what it's about um, as you as you emulate Christ. But um, anyway, yeah, we, we want to be like Christ. We want to be disciples of Christ. Um, he says, I frankly do not have the ability to describe adequately the precise nature and power of our covenant connection with the resurrected and living Son of God. I always love it when they emphasize that, that he's... It's like trying to wake us up that, hey, he is he's not just an idea in your head or just something that happened long ago. He's currently alive and um, he's living. 
Uh, but I witness that the connections with him and Heavenly Father are real and are the ultimate sources of assurance, peace, joy, and the spiritual strength that enable us to, quote, fear not, though the enemy deride. Here, here's just another instance where, as the world gets worse and more wicked and uh, the powerful seek more power and to implement their plans, um, we have this. We have from an apostle. He's telling that we have the assurance of peace, joy, and the spiritual strength that enables us to not be afraid, even though the enemy is seems to be winning or seems to be making progress. This is the attitude that we should have right now as the second coming approaches. Peace, joy. As covenant-making and covenant-keeping disciples of Jesus Christ, uh, we can be blessed to take, quote, courage, for the Lord is on our side. This is another example. Here you go. Don't be afraid. The Lord is on your side. And pay no attention to evil influences and secular scoffing. As I visit the members of the church around the world, I often ask them this question. What helps you to heed not worldly influences, mocking and scorn? <clears throat> Their answers are most instructive. Um, I'm going to skip down because, again, we're not really so much focusing on that in this video. Okay, gospel covenants and ordinances <clears throat> operate in our lives much like a compass. A compass is a device used to indicate the cardinal directions of north, south, east, and west for purposes of navigation and geographic orientation. In a similar way, our covenants and ordinances point us to and help us always remember our connection with the Lord Jesus Christ as we progress along the covenant path. And then here's a visual aid, right? North, the thing right here is pointing north, just like how um, the covenants, they, they point us toward Christ, right? And it's fitting that you have the apostles here in the background. It's interesting that he chose a picture of uh, this is the Christus in the visitor center for the Rome Italy temple. And this is where president Nelson said uh, that the church had reached a hinge point. It's not the only time he said that he's also said it in regards to the, um, the April, 2020 general conference. So he said it two times, but this right here, the Rome Italy temple, when this happened, this really seemed to be, a very significant event. But anyway, so it's it's neat that he's using a picture from there. Uh, the cardinal direction for all of us in mortality is to come unto and be perfected in Christ. Holy covenants and ordinances keep us, uh, to help us to keep our focus upon the Savior and strive with his grace to become more like him. Most assuredly, an unseen power will aid me and you in the glorious cause of truth. Yeah. Sometimes I, I feel like we lose that idea of um, discipleship. Because, like, when you're, when you're studying other religions, because, like, a disciple is... Okay, let's look up the actual definition. Disciple definition. Um, a personal follower of Jesus during his life, especially one of the 12 apostles. Um, another, th another thing here is a follower or student of a teacher, leader, or philosopher. When I was in college, uh, I remember, you know, followers of like Socrates and Plato being referred to as disciples. And um, when you read about that, they, they really wanted to understand whatever that philosophy was. And, and it happens in other religious traditions uh, aside from philosophy and aside from our own. And sometimes I, I, I think that we don't, we don't view ourselves as disciples. We more view ourselves as like card holders, like, Oh, you know, I have my, here's my baptism card. Here's my temple recommend. Um, I'm good. Just like, just like you've um, achieved, like you've won a trophy or you've earned a certificate and then you're done uh, rather than, you're someone that has like made a very deep commitment to uh, live as fully as possible the teachings of the master, right? 
and uh, it, it's it's a continual process. We we have to look at ourselves and we have to like uh, follow all of his teachings. So Elder Bednar is saying that we need to do the covenants and then we need to honor them. And uh, yeah. Okay, holding fast to the iron rod, our covenant connection with God and Jesus Christ is the channel through which we can receive the capacity and strength to heed not. And this bond is strengthened as we continually hold fast to the rod, the rod of iron. But as Nephi's brethren asked, what meaneth the rod of iron which our father saw? Um, and Nephi said unto them that it is the word of God. And whoso would hearken unto the word of God and would hold fast unto it, they would never perish. Neither could, could the temptations and the fiery darts of the adversary overpower them unto blindness and lead them away to destruction. So, um, yeah, so the word of God is a way to protect yourself from the fiery darts of the adversary and uh, being deceived. Being, uh, uh, you, could, you could even go as far as to say brainwashed by the world. Because when you're surrounded by these influences, it conditions you to think a certain way. But if you have the word of God and hold fast to it, uh, that will help you overcome these things and not be a person that's in the great and spacious building. Uh, please note that the ability to resist the temptations and the fiery darts of the adversary is promised to those individuals who, quote unquote, hold fast to rather than merely cling to the word of God. Yeah, because clinging is like, you're like barely holding on, or it's like a struggle for you to hold on. But if you're holding fast to, it's like, um, you're, um, you're solidly holding on to it. Okay, interestingly, the Apostle John described Jesus Christ as the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we, we beheld the glory, uh, we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Therefore, one of the names of Jesus Christ is the word. Which, again, it's very interesting. I, I don't mean to keep bringing up... Judaism uh, necessarily because they they could have this portion of it could be wrong but they're very very fond of words they're fond of gematria which is the practice of associating letters with numbers and they're and then therefore words have numerical values when you add up the letters uh, they also view it as the way that the world the world was literally created was through speech which again I'm not saying that that's necessarily our doctrine but it, it does seem to kind of jive and and uh with them not accepting christ it's interesting because he is the word and he is the one that if he use if he if that's how you do it and it, it seems like maybe it is because we read an article recently talking about how faith uh, no this was in the um what's it called lectures on faith uh, th from the time of Joseph Smith, where he was talking about how faith operates uh, by words, and that words are very power powerful. It was uh, Elder Holland who was quoting him, or he was quoting that portion of Lectures on Faith. And um, so words, <laughs> and this comes after my apology... <laughs> Oh gosh, words <laughs> words are important. They are important. Uh, I'm going to skip down. <clears throat> Here's the end of the talk. He says, "Let me suggest <clears throat> sorry, let me suggest that holding fast to the word of God entails one, remembering, honoring and strengthening <clears throat> the personal connection we have with the savior and his father through the covenants and ordinances of the restored gospel. Uh, two, prayerfully, earnestly, and consistently using the Holy Scriptures and the teachings of the living prophets and apostles as sure sources of revealed truth. And um, that's why I make it a priority on my channel. 
we look at a lot of things. We we don't always like look only at <clears throat> what the general authorities have said and so forth. But whenever I'm try we're trying to like tie down an idea or find the root of some idea in the gospel, you've got to tie it down uh, to these things, to the scriptures, and and understand what the scriptures are actually saying through the clarification uh, given in the in the interpretation given by the prophet and the apostles. Okay, as we are bound and quote unquote hold fast uh, to the Lord and are transformed by his living doctrine, I promise that individually and collectively we will be blessed to stand in holy places and it shall not be moved. That makes me think how it's like you're you're standing firm in your testimony. You're standing firm upon sound doctrine. Not, of course, we know that there are literal holy places like being in the temple. Your house is is a holy place. Okay, going to church, uh, being at the stake center, things like that. Those are holy places. But I think that there's kind of like double meaning here, where just simply living inside of your covenants, uh, you're standing in a holy place, metaphorically speaking, and uh, shall not be moved. And then he says, if we abide in Christ, then he will abide in and walk with us. Surely, now this is interesting, surely in the days of trial, his saints will be ch will cheer and prosper the cause of truth. And uh, this seems kind of prophetic, just because, and everyone knows that the days ahead are going to get harder and harder. So this is what we got to do. You know, we got to really hold on to the iron, the iron rod. Uh, we ne need to listen to the words of Christ. We need to become like him and be true disciples and not just, you know, card holders, you know, like a Costco membership. <laughs> I love Costco, by the way. I love it around the holiday season when they they, they have the Christmas stuff out. I know I know not everybody is a big fan of that, but I am, and uh, it, it always gladdens my heart when I see the Christmas stuff out. I always like to go see it. Okay, so okay, so here's the first uh, step in this, like this, or the first whatever however you want to think of it. You have these three talks in in articles here's the first one okay so he's he's uh, establishing covenants being yoked to christ uh peace safety in those things okay now we're moving on to the july uh 2022 article of his in the lehona and it's called temple ordinances preparing to return to god's presence now, this is interesting because I think we're facing that right now. Uh, there, there's there's two ways that you can look at this. Uh, the ultimate sense, the ultimate sense, and that is that you'll return into the Father's presence and uh, have exaltation in the celestial kingdom. Uh, however, uh, we are about to have the King here, literally, with us on Earth. And um, those that are not worthy will not be here, right? Those that, that don't meet a certain standard. Um, those that are wicked, those that are living in telestial law. So I think that you can look at what he's about to say here in those two ways. The ultimate sense, the final judgment, and then the secondary sense, which is the, the second coming. being in Because Christ is God. He is the God of the Old Testament. Um, he is the God of Israel. Right. Under the father, of course. OK, so let's see what he says here. Here's the the Mesa Temple. I love the Mesa Temple. OK, God's work in his glory is, quote, to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man to prepare us to live, quote, in a higher and holier way. So we can return to his presence. This is a really big concept right now, uh, this phrase, a higher and holier way. The first time I remember this being used in recent memory was uh, when uh, ministering was introduced. 
that it, it was described as a higher and holier way compared to home teaching and visiting teaching. And there's actually a reference here. Let's see. Yeah, that goes to President Nelson closing remarks of, um, I guess, the October 2019 General Conference. Higher and holier way. So we can return to his presence. You know, we, we really better focus on this. Uh, you know, I, I just went through this uh, thing with, you know, using words, did the apology. And I, I'm really, really thankful that it happened because I'm not sure how long that kind of thing would have remained unchecked. You know, it, it was painful, but that's what happens in refinement. You know, if you're just like, if you're a block of marble or stone or whatever, and you're being carved into something uh, beautiful, some masterpiece, um, yeah, you have to knock off all the hard edges. And, uh, you know, if, if a stone had feet. <laughs> If a stone had feelings and could feel it, uh, it's probably pretty painful having big things knocked off of you. Um, but, you know, I, I really think this is something we should all do. Look at ourselves, our, our, our little things that we're struggling with and uh, knock some more of those pieces off as we get ready for the second coming, you know. They're, they're asking us to do this, to become live a higher and holier way. Okay, in his infinite and eternal mercy, the Lord, through his prophets and apostles, has continually invited his sons and his daughters to prepare for his coming and become a Zion people, ready to be raised up to meet him. Now this, being raised up to meet him, that seems to be pointing to the both the resurrection and uh, the translation event, which whenever you read about it, they seem to go together like it's a simultaneous thing. As far as as far as what I can tell. Um, what's interesting here is that he says. The Lord, through his prophets and apostles, has continually invited his sons and daughters to prepare for his coming. So it's interesting because. First of all, they were prepared back in Old Testament times for his first coming. But also, interestingly, I think in a sense they've been prepared for uh, to be raised up to meet him when the, the first resurrection happens. So both like for his first coming and then his second coming. And his second coming includes all the righteous uh, from previous generations uh, that have had their work done. Unfortunately, those that have not had their work done, they're going to have to wait till, I, I believe, they're going to have to wait till it's done. Then, once they've accepted those covenants, if, if they choose to do so, then they can be resurrected to a celestial body. But um, it's my understanding that those covenants have to come, the ordinances have to come first. So he, uh, he quotes Alma 12.24, Let's see what that says. Now, this would have been Old Testament times, Alma. And we see that death comes upon mankind, yea, the death which was, uh, which has been spoken of by Amulek, which is the temporal death. Never, nevertheless, there is a space granted unto man in which he might repent. Therefore, this life be became a probationary state, sta a time to prepare to meet God. A time to prepare for the endless state which has been spoken of by us, which is after the resurrection of the dead. Okay. And then chapter 34, 32. For behold, this, this life is the time for men to prepare to meet God. Yea, behold, the day of this life is the day for men to perform their labors. Doctrine and Covenants 45, 45. Okay. But, but before the arm of the Lord shall fall, an angel shall sound his trump, and the saints, the saints that have slept shall come forth to meet me in the cloud. So, I mean, here it is right here. This is the actual event. We've read an article in the Ensign which clarifies, it, it, it confirms, yes, this is an actual literal thing that's going to happen where we um, meet him in the air. You know, because some people may take that 
you know, metaphorically, you'd be like, no. Um, and it also may sound kind of like a, like other Christian churches type thing. They refer to it as the rapture, um, which is fine. Uh, we don't typically call it that here in the church. But, yeah, it's interesting that he's referencing this right here. Okay, Doctrine and Covenants 65, verse 5. Call upon the Lord that his kingdom may go forth upon the earth, that the inhabitants thereof may receive it, and be prepared for the days to come in which uh, the Son of Man will come down in heaven, clothed with the brightness of his glory, to meet the kingdom of God which is set up on the earth. Okay, and now uh, section 88, I can already tell you what this is about. Section 88 is the big second coming section of the Doctrine and Covenants. Probably, probably like if there was a main one, I, I would probably say section 88 is, is that. And they, the saints that are upon the earth who are alive shall be quickened and be caught up to meet him. And they who have slept in their graves shall come forth, for their graves shall be opened, and they also shall be caught up to meet him in the midst of the pillar of heaven. Okay. So this is how he starts out this article. Okay. Prepare, preparing, look at this, preparing to return to God's presence. And he's talking about the resurrection and the translation, the, the rapture, the quickening whatever you want to call it it's all the same thing okay the word rapture my understanding is that it comes from it's like um you know it's like from the greek translation from the greek new testament uh, raptura which means to be to be snatched up right so it, that's that's all it is so it's just kind of a cultural thing i think why they use that word so much and always central to the preparation has been learning the doctrine of jesus christ exercising faith in him repenting and receiving sacred covenants and ordinances okay so preparing for the second coming uh just like for eternal life uh faith repentance baptism you know sacred and the, and the rest of the ordinances Examples in the Old Testament of God's invitation to his children to prepare to live a higher law and to receive the covenants and the ordinance of salvation are instructed for us today. Yeah, he, he just gave us a hint that the church is wanting us right now to live a higher, holier way. And interestingly, uh, Elder Benar talked about this invitation in his most recent talk right here put on the from october 22 uh, 2022 general conference put on thy strength O zion where he kind of expands and expounds on the parable of the marriage feast and he talks about how with a with a typical jewish marriage first there's a invitation sent out well in advance of the wedding and then another one uh the day of Okay, on like the first day, because like the, I guess the wedding takes place over the course of like a week or two, according to what he said in the talk. So, but right here, back in July, he was talking about an invitation. Examples in the Old Testament of God's invitation to his children to prepare to live a higher law and to receive the covenants and ordinances of, of salvation are instructive for us today. And by the way, I'm pretty sure that during the millennium, there's probably going to be new things revealed, like new, um, basically new commandments. And and even Bruce R. McConkie in Millennial Messiah, we read uh, in there that he expected that during the millennium, there'd be doctrines revealed that we have no concept of right now. So, and the, and the Jews are expecting the same thing. They're, now, they're expecting messiah to come for the first time they they miss the fact that the messiah is jesus christ but um i still think that they're prepared for the millennium and for the second coming and they they have the expectation in the way that they view things that there's going to be new uh mitzvot or new commandments that are revealed by mashiach when he comes right and i think that's something that we're kind of in sync with that during this period the millennium 
there will probably be higher, holier commandments and ways of doing things, uh, no doubt. In Exodus, God encouraged Israel to become, quote, a peculiar treasure, end quote, and to <clears throat> sanctify themselves in preparation to meet him. Jehovah gave Israel, quote, tables of stone and a law and commandments. And they covenanted with God, saying, all that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. And the Lord promised if they were obedient to their, their covenants, he would dwell among them. Oh, this is interesting. I just talked to I just talked to Rabbi Gerfing about this phrase today. Yeah, we I literally <clears throat> I was in Exodus twenty five because it says it in uh, Exodus twenty five, but he was making a point that that God in that time he didn't dwell in the temple. The way that it's worded is that. Uh, I'm going to pull it up. I can't I can't believe this. I just talked to Rabbi Gerfin about this today. He is the rabbi uh, in Israel. He's an Orthodox Jew that I talk to every other week. Let's see, Old Testament. I was set up with him through Israel 365, uh, which is that news company. Let's see. So it says here, According to all that I shew thee after the pattern of the, of the tabernacle. Um, okay, sorry. According to all that I shew thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make. And then it, he says how to do it. Um, no, he must have said it before. Yeah, the, the verse before. And let them make a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So he was just basically saying that when we follow the commandments, okay, we follow the instructions of God, we follow the commandments. In Judaism, they believe that there's 613 commandments. Um, a portion of them are positive, meaning like till the earth, take care of the garden, and then the other set or the other category would be negative. Like don't, don't partake of the tree of the, the don't partake of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So that's how they view it. But he was talking about how the way that they read this is that, you know, with the temple there in following the commandments that God dwells with you, that when you're, when you're obeying the commandments, it's like, he's there with you anyway. That's really cool that that just happened. Okay. And then and then Elder Bednar says it here. He would dwell among them. However, when Israel witnessed uh, the glory of the Lord upon Mount Sinai, they were afraid, stood afar off, and eventually rebelled against God. We've talked about the fact that this event right here, Mount Sinai, this is, this is when Israel as a nation, even though... You know, there there was already the Abrahamic covenant, but uh, before this time, but as as a nation, this is when Israel was essentially entered into the betrothal with the Lord, uh, the engagement, right? And a betrothal is just as good as a marriage without being marriage itself. And we've talked about the fact that that was the basically the betrothal event, and that when Christ comes for the second coming, that's when the actual marriage happens. Uh, and we've looked at the Jewish feast days. Uh, this event right here, Mount Sinai, in receiving the commandments, it uh, matches up with Shavuot, which is the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost. Let's see. Um, here we go, Judaism. Then go down to Feast Overview. So this right here, the fourth of the spring feast, this is this commemorates the Ten Commandments and basically entering into the betrothal. They, I don't know if Judy, if in Judaism they view it as a betrothal. I think they view it as a marriage. But anyway, we've talked about we've talked about the fall feast, and I feel like I think there's a good case to be made that the Feast of Trumpets or Rosh Hashanah. 
may be the time when Adam on Ayaman happens or possibly the day that Christ becomes king, you know, when he marries his bride, the church. Um, it's just an interesting thing. Anyway, okay. A second is an example of the Old Testament. Sorry, a second example in the Old Testament is of King Solomon building a house unto the Lord. The Ark of the Covenant and other sacred vessels were placed in the most holy place, and the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Solomon offered a dedicatory prayer and asked for temporal and spiritual blessings to be bestowed upon repentant and prayerful Israel. The Lord heard their prayers of supplication and promised Israel great blessings if they were obedient. Nevertheless, Israel forsook the forsook the Lord and worshipped false gods. Other prophets, and by the way, we should not do that. I think that's the takeaway for us. Do not be distracted. Do not have your heart upon the things of this world. Uh, material things, you know, the honors of men, being popular. Okay. And, and the gospel is not a popular thing. <laughs> You've got to choose. Okay, you've got to choose. Typically, typically, the gospel in its fullness is not a popular thing. Okay. Other prophets in the Old Testament sought diligently to teach and sanctify Israel, so, quote, they, may, they might behold the face of God, uh, put thy, th th but they hardened their hearts and could not endure his presence. There's been a lot of talk, you guys, about seeing the face of the Lord, being in his presence. We've covered it a lot on this channel, and here's just more, you know, just July of this year. Uh, repeatedly, the children of Israel were unbelieving, afraid, or unwilling to change. Okay, so let's not do that. Let's not be unbelieving, afraid, or unwilling to change. Uh, desired an easier path. Had their hearts set on worldly things, or willingly rebelled against the Lord and his apostles. Every time Israel turned away from God and forsook their covenants and ordinances, the, the Lord's anger was kindled against them, and they could not receive the fullness of his glory. Okay, divine purpose of gathering. Now, this is interesting because, okay, this last conference, uh, October 2022, Elder Bednar spoke, and he spoke right before President Nelson's main talk in the, in the Saturday morning session. It was the main talk of conference, the longest one uh, for, the, for the prophet, 18 minutes, 43 seconds. And here he talks about, um, oh, I lost my train of thought, oh, the, the purpose of the gathering. Let's see, I'm going to... Look up crucial. Okay. Here, President Nelson says, As I have stated before, the gathering of Israel is the most important work taking place on the earth today. One crucial element of this gathering is preparing a people who are able, ready, and worthy to receive the Lord when he comes again. A people who have already chosen Jesus Christ over this fallen world, a people who rejoice in their agency to live the higher, holier laws of Jesus Christ. I call upon you, my dear brothers and sisters, to become this righteous people. So it really feels like um, Elder Bednar and President Nelson are very in sync. I'm sure that they all are. I don't think that President Nelson and Elder Bednar had like separate meetings and they're like, hey, okay, now I want you to say this and oh, okay, I'll say this and then you say that and then afterwards I'll say this. Um, whatever the case, you know, how, how, however this all works out, uh, the two of them are very much on the same page and, and really sharing the same message when it comes to, you know, the, the second coming. <laughs> and uh, covenants, and living a higher, holier way. Because if I weren't to say who said what, and you just mix this all up together, you would just assume it's all the same talk. Okay, so back to Elder Bednar, July, Liahona. 
the divine purpose of gathering. The Lord's efforts to gather his people and bless them through temple covenants and the ordinances uh, also are recounted in the New Testament and the Book of Mormon. The Savior lamented, How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings, and ye would not. The Prophet Joseph Smith explained, quote, What was the object of gathering the people of God in any age of the world? The main object was to build unto the Lord a house whereby he could reveal unto his people the ordinances of his house and the glories of his kingdom and teach the people the way of salvation, that they might receive revelations from heaven and be perfected in the things of the kingdom of God, but they would not. This is also interesting because, again, uh, with President Nelson in this talk, talking about one of the most important parts of the gathering is being ready to receive the Lord, right? We already have temples. Christ has appeared in the temples. We we have times that are recorded, like when he appeared in the Salt Lake Temple to Lorenzo Snow. He appeared in the Kirtland Temple to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery. Um, and I'm sure that he's appeared many other times. Um, maybe just maybe to individual saints or people that whatever ready for their calling calling an election made sure for all I know. But uh, as a church, we're all getting ready for Christ to come. And it's interesting that in the, in the last talk by president Nelson, he, I better go to it. He shows a clip of Christ descending through the air and then he says, right here, it is significant that the Savior chose to appear to the people at the temple. It is his house. Uh, it is filled with his power. So, you guys, it really, as we're thinking about the second coming, we really, just like he, just like the name of this talk, the name of his last talk is Focus on the Temple focus on the temple. Okay. So that's what Joseph Smith said, that, that the purpose during any age of the world was to build a house of the Lord so that his presence could be among the people. Uh, the Lord desires to gather his children in this dispensation. It has revealed, quote, things which have been kept hid from before the foundation of the world, all things pertaining to this house and the priesthood thereof. He encourages all of us to prepare to return to his presence, made possible through his atoning sacrifice. Behold, it is my will that all they who call upon my name and worship me according to my name, my everlasting gospel, should gather together and stand in holy places. Why are temple and ordinances so important? Temples are the most holy of all places of worship. Everything that is learned and all that is done in Latter-day temples emphasize Heavenly Father's great plan of happiness, the divinity of Jesus Christ, and his role as our Savior. The covenants received and the ordinances performed in the temples are essential to the sanctifying of our hearts and for the ultimate exaltation of God's sons and daughters. Uh, quote, this is from DNC 84, verses 19 through 21. And his greater priesthood administereth the gospel and holdeth the key to the mysteries of the kingdom, even the key of the knowledge of God. Uh, the greater priesthood being the Melchizedek priesthood, of course. Therefore, in the ordinances thereof, the power of godliness is manifest. And without the ordinances thereof, and the authority of the priesthood, the power of godliness is not manifest unto men in the flesh. So Melchizedek priesthood is necessary, right? And uh, this, this is what you do. You go to the temple, learn the mysteries of God. Sacred ordinances that are received worthily and remembered continually upon uh, open the heavenly channels through which the power of godliness can flow into our lives. By receiving priesthood ordinances and making and keeping sacred covenants, we are yoked to and with the Savior and can be blessed with strength beyond our uh, beyond our own to overcome the temptations and challenges of mortality as we prepare to return to God's presence. 
the blessings of temple covenants and ordinances. Uh, two of the important blessings received from the temple covenants, from temple covenants and ordinances, are increasing joy and power. Okay, joy and power; those two. The Redeemer is the ultimate and only source of enduring joy. True joy comes from exercising faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, worthily receiving and faithfully honoring sacred covenants and ordinances, and striving to become deeply converted to the Savior and his purposes. Yep, you will not find true happiness in this life by acquiring material things. Um, you know, th these things, they bring pleasure, but they won't bring... Uh, the joy, the happiness that you need on a deep level, right? And I think that you can tell that with people, people that aren't truly happy, even though they have everything in the world. And and it may not have to be just material things. It could be, again, the honors of men. Maybe you've, you're, in, you, you might be poor, but you've done amazing things. Like people really think that you're amazing for breaking this record or, having had this position in government or what, whatever, none of, none of those things will bring you true happiness. Um, Alma taught his son that greater holiness and joy in our lives is made possible as we are cleansed and sanctified through the atonement of Jesus Christ. Only by having faith in our Redeemer, repenting and keeping covenants are we able to receive the lasting happiness we all desire to experience and retain. Please note the promise of joy from President Russell M. Nelson. Quote, we invite all of God's children on both sides of the veil to come unto their Savior, receive the blessings of the Holy Temple, uh, having having or have enduring joy, and qualify for eternal life. End quote. In our day, as the powers of darkness rage and threaten our peace to destroy, protective power is available to each of us in and through temple covenants and ordinances. Nephi saw in vision and beheld the power of the Lamb of God, that it descended upon the covenant people of the Lord, and they were armed with righteousness and with the power of God in great glory. Power. That's the second thing. So joy and power. The power of God. In the dedication, in the dedicatory prayer of the Kirtland Temple, the Prophet Joseph Smith petitioned the Father Quote, that thy servants may go forth from this house armed with thy power, and that no combination of wickedness shall rise up and prevail over thy people, upon whom thy name shall be put in this house. This is a that's an interesting phrase, that no combination of wickedness, because that seems to refer possibly to secret combinations. And um that's something we do not we do not need to worry about, and I, I know that the enemy seems like they have so much power, and they do, and there are secret combinations, and, um, you know, I'm sure that the church, there, there's probably so many untold stories uh, that we're not going to know until later between the church and secret combinations that have tried to, you know, get into the church or try to influence or sway or manipulate the church threaten the church. You know, I don't think that we know at all. But, you know, I I have faith and trust in this prayer by Joseph Smith that no combination of wickedness shall rise up and prevail over thy people upon whom my name uh, shall be put in this house. I, I really think that we can trust that. I really do. Uh, each of us should strive to learn about and better understand the protecting power of covenants and ordinances available in the house of the Lord, so that we as disciples may stand in holy places and be not moved and withstand the evil day. So uh, he's telling us we, we should try and learn more about the protecting power of the covenants and ordinances, and he just gave us a bunch of scriptures right here. I'm not going to go through those right now. The video is already kind of getting long. Anyway, and then he ends it here. Uh, I invite you to diligently learn about 
learn about and appreciate the etern- eternal importance of temple covenants, temple ordinances, and temple worship as you strive to come unto the Savior and receive the blessings made possible through his atonement. Um, and I joy- joyfully testify that God, the Father, and his Son, Jesus Christ, live, and their greatest des- desire for us is to return to their presence and partake of their glory. Let's look at these scriptures. Doctrine and Covenants 97.16 Yea, and my presence shall be there in the temple, of course, for I will come into it in all the pure in heart sorry, in all the pure in heart that shall come into it shall see God. Uh, Remember what President Nelson said that we, you know, will see God with our spiritual eyes. Although, you know, he can literally appear there um i wouldn't i wouldn't make the assumption that if you haven't literally met christ in the temple that you're unworthy because it says here that all the pure in heart so don't leave thinking oh man i must not be pure of heart um i'm pretty sure that most of the time it's seeing the the savior spiritually with our spiritual eyes um as we learn you know as we go through the endowment and other things in the temple 101, 38, and seek the face of the Lord always, that in patience he may possess your souls, and you shall have eternal life. Oh, I wanted to read this. I forgot to, okay, sorry, I don't know how I forgot this. Okay, so he says, let's skip back up here. He says, each of us should strive to learn about, learn about and better understand the protecting power of covenants and ordinances available in the house of the Lord, so that we as disciples may stand in holy places and not be moved. Doctrine and Covenants 4532. Okay, maybe this is not what I thought. Hold on. I swear I did this earlier as I as I was as I was uh skimming through the article. So verse 32, if you go up here to the chapter heading, verse 32 would fall uh, within this, the gospel will be restored, the times of the Gentiles will be fulfilled, and a desolating sickness will cover the land. And then after that, signs, wonders, and the resurrection are to attend the second coming. So Elder Bednar, after he, at the beginning of this article, he uh, he cites these different scriptures talking about the quickening in the translation event right here, right, being raised up to meet him in the air. And then later, at the end of the talk, he references this. Oh, where to go? He references this scripture, section 45, verse 32. That's, it, it's just talking about the second coming. It's just right in the middle of all this talk about the second coming. So, it's pretty incredible, and I, I must say, I think that's what he has in mind as he's giving these messages. He's talking in the sense that, yes, we need to be ready for the ultimate judgment and to enter into the presence of the Father, but we also need to prepare to meet God, Jesus Christ, when he comes for the second coming. And then, so that's step two. So we did step one right here with, uh, we, he- we heeded them not. April 2022 General Conference, Elder Bednar, and then his talk, or his article, I mean, July 2022, Temple Ordinances, Preparing to re- to Return to God's Presence. And then, uh, let me get back to it, this talk that he gave this time, October 2022, immediately before President Nelson calls on us to be the people to receive the Savior. Uh, I don't think it's any accident at all whatsoever that Elder Bednar spoke right before uh, President Nelson, and he talks in pretty explicit terms like, hey, uh, we were warned a long time ago, we received the invitation a long time ago, and then the day of the wedding, or the first day of the proceedings, there's another 
there's another invitation that's sent out. And immediately the next talk, it seems like President Nelson gives us that invitation. And he talks a lot here about wearing the wedding garment. And he, re he repeats the word garment. And in our church, the word garment has a special meaning. Um, he talked about those that refuse to wear the garment. Those that refuse to... They want, they want to try and uh, have all the benefits without doing what's asked of them. Or trying to, trying to do it their own way rather than the king's way. Um, yeah, so it, it's just, yeah, this was a really good find, Rhonda. Thank you for the email and sharing this with us. I, yeah, I think I'd have to agree that these three, uh, talks, articles put together, they like build on top of each other. And it's stunning that the last one is all about a parable that has to do with the second coming and how to be ready for the second coming. So <laughs> it, it's just, I've never seen anything like this in my life. I really haven't. Lifelong member. I've never seen this. Okay. Well, that's going to be it for this one. I hope you enjoyed it. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video. If you liked it, leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also, make sure to share this with anyone that, you know, anyone that's a big fan of Elder Bednar or just anybody that may be missing some of these things, you know, that it might be going over their head. Share it with them. And I'll talk to you guys later.